So this is the second week of our Becoming series, and I just want to ask you if you've ever thought about this, how strong Jesus was spiritually. Have you ever thought about how strong he was? Because he knew his mission, right? He, he always knew his mission. He knew what he came to do, and that night when he, when he made that decision in the garden, he said, the spirit is willing, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I can tell you that you can count on this fact. The flesh is always, always, always going to be weak. The flesh is going to want to run, right? When, when times get hard, when things are tough, when there's pain involved, the flesh or the sin nature or the human nature in you wants to, to run. You just want to get away from that pain, right? That's our human nature. Jesus had that too. You don't think about this very often, but Jesus had a sin nature. If he hadn't had a sin nature, there would have been nothing there to be tempted the scripture says he was tempted in all ways that we are, yet without sin. You see how strong his spirit had to be to overcome the weakness of the flesh, the weakness of the sin nature, the weakness of selfish, human selfishness, the weakness of human pride, the weakness that all of that entails. And he was strong. He was so strong. He knew that he was about, and I, I talked about this a little bit last week, but he knew that he was going to have to face the weight of the sins of all of humanity, and he was willing. Wow. Wow. He was strong. So he wants us to be strong. The Apostle Paul talked about us becoming strong. And so today we're going to talk about becoming spiritually fit. This is a real thing. This is not something, you know, some cute little thing that I came up with to talk about. This is a real thing that the scripture talks about. It's a real thing that was a, that was a reality for Jesus. It was a reality for the Apostle Paul and all of the disciples who became apostles. It was... It was real for them. They were spiritually fit. They were spiritually strong. And so I want you to become uh, familiar with one word. It's a Greek word. It's a Greek word that I learned years ago, and I've never forgotten it. It's always on the tip of my tongue, tongue and it's always on the tip of my tongue. How about that? Sharp. Um, so it's always on the tip of my tongue, and the word is... Gumnazo. Can you say that with me? Gumnazo. One more time. Gumnazo. Um, it's the word that we, it's the Greek word that we get our word gymnasium from. So when you're going to the gym, you're going to uh, the gymnazo. Gumnazo means to exercise. Exercise. And Paul said we should exercise our spirits. Exercise our spirits. Um, so, the situation that we find ourselves in is that we are always in the spiritual gym. You don't have to go get your gym bag, you know, and get your shoes and get your shorts and your, your t-shirt and your whatever music you listen to, you don't have to do that to go to the spiritual gym because we are always, always in this spiritual gym. And, and so many of us are thinking about going to the, the physical gym to work out our physical bodies and get in shape this year. How many of you are thinking about that? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> We have a group of high achievers. <laughs> we don't need all that stuff anyway. We're so spiritual. Uh, so, 
We're always in the gym. We're always in the, the spiritual gym. Everywhere we go, every place we are, every person we interact with, every situation that comes our way, it's always an opportunity for us to work out spiritually. So I found this thing. It was, it was uh, kind of funny. I was reading all these articles on uh, the, the word gymnazo, and then I was reading about um, our our practices of working out, and I kind of got sidetracked, and I was reading a bunch of stuff about gym, uh, people who go to the gym, and why they go, and their motivation, and all this stuff, what works and what doesn't work, and I ran across this article, and it talked about some terms that people use for people who go to the gym to work out. You probably all heard the term gym rat, right? That's somebody who loves to go to the gym. They love to work out. They're always there. They're gym rats. Um, but there's some other terms that I found, and I just thought this was funny. And I did, I'm not going to show you all of them, but uh, there were three that stood out to me. And it's these three right here. The talk show host, the mayor, and the couch potato. Okay, so the talk show host is the person who comes to the gym to talk. They talk. They're working their muscles, but it's these muscles that they're working. You ever, you ever seen somebody at the gym? They come in, and they're talking to everybody, and you wonder, when are they going to work out? And then they leave, right? Uh, there was a, a group of guys that I knew, um, friends of mine, that worked out uh, early in the morning. Too early for me. Uh, but they worked out early in the morning. And they were always teasing this one guy in the group because he never worked out. He drank coffee and talked to them while they worked out at 5 o'clock in the morning. And so he would be a talk show host. Talk show host. Then the mayor, the mayor is the person who comes to the gym to meet people and socialize. You ever seen people like this? They, they come and they're, they're just there to meet people. It's not really... They're coming for the purpose, the real purpose of the gym. They're coming to meet people and to socialize. And then there's the couch potato, the person who is sitting on the bench watching television. You know, they're zoned out, you know, either on what's on the screen or maybe uh, the book that they brought to read or the magazine. Um, They are the couch potato. And And the reason these three caught my eye is because I think that in the kingdom, you also have these three, right? You have these three, the talk show host, the person who is coming to church or they're coming to a small group or whatever, just to talk and to have that outlet of people, you know, to talk to. And then there's the mayor, the person who comes to socialize. Um, one time, somebody was telling me the story. I was at a, I was at a church and I was talking about, oh, so-and-so uh, greets people at uh, our, our door on Sunday morning. And the person I was talking to, they said, really? Uh, that person also greets people at our door at our church <laughs> as well. What service do they come to at your church? And what the person was doing was they were coming to our church, and they were on our greeting team. And then they went to another church, and they were on their team. They were there to socialize. They were there to meet people and to, uh, to talk to people. And then you have the couch potato, which is kind of, I can identify with this a little bit because I love to go to other churches and watch. I like to be a spectator and I like to watch what they do. And because I've been involved with church so, so much over my adult life, I evaluate, you know, and I, and I like to watch other churches on television uh, because I, I like to see what the pastor's doing and how they do their worship service and their transitions and, and all these things. And I just, I love that. So that is the couch potato. But, you know, we can do this at the gym, but we can also do this in our spiritual lives too. We can, we can come to church and we can go through the motions of doing all these things. We can join a small group. We can uh, be in a Bible study. We can do all these things and not really be serious about our spiritual training. So first thing I would say to you is get serious about your training. Get serious about your training. This is what the Apostle Paul said to Timothy. We always call him young Timothy because Timothy was a young guy and Paul was like a spiritual father to him. 
And he said this, 1 Timothy. He says, don't waste time arguing over foolish ideas and silly myths and legends. Spend your time and energy in the exercise, gymnazo, of keeping spiritually fit. This is what he's telling He's telling Timothy. A lot of people in ministry, I've known them all my life. People in ministry, they just want to talk ministry. They want to talk it to death. They, they would love to talk to you about theology and what you believe in. I, I'm one of them. I love to talk about theology. I love to talk about what we believe and what's true and what's not true. And, and this group believes this and this group believes that. And I just I love the conversation. I mean, many people do get into these arguments. And I, I had a friend in college uh, that, I, that I always uh, would argue with about theology. And, um, and it got us nowhere. I mean, it really did nothing for either one of us. Uh, but we used to do that. We used to argue over foolish ideas and silly myths and legends. So he says, spend your time rather, instead of wasting your time on these foolish arguments, Spend your time and energy in the exercise of keeping spiritually fit. You know what he's saying. A little less talk and a little more action. A little less talk and a little more action. That that was an Elvis song, by the way. He says bodily exercise is all right. Now, some some translations say it differently, that uh, bodily exercise is good. And I would would agree with that. Don't don't, Don't you think? Uh, bodily exercise is good. Is it good to get out and hike, Steve? It's good. Uh, I've, been, I've been running, trying, okay, trying to run a mile every day. And I can run a mile every day. And the last week I ran two miles one night. And you know what it is? It's painful. <laughs> it's painful. Let's just be honest about it. It's painful. Um, and so is spiritual exercise. So bodily exercise, he says, is all right. But spiritual exercise is much more important and is a tonic for all you do. So if you're having trouble with discipline in other areas of your life, start disciplining your spirit and it will carry over. That's what he's saying. It's a tonic for all you do. So exercise, gymnazo, yourself spiritually and practice being a better Christian because that is will help you not only now in this life, but it will help you in the next life too. And then he says this. He says, this is the truth, and everyone should accept it. We work hard and suffer much. We work hard and we suffer much in order that people will believe it. I want to tell you something. People are never going to believe us. They're never going to believe us if we are not willing to work hard and suffer for what we believe. They're never going to believe. It's never going to be real to them unless they see us getting stronger spiritually. Would you believe, uh, you know, the 90-pound weakling when he's telling you about how He exercises at the gym and how great it is to go to the gym. Would you believe the guy that is getting no results? No. You're going to believe the guy who's buff, who who has some results. Something to show for his work and his suffering in the gym. We work hard and suffer much in order that people will believe it. For our hope is in the living God who died for all and particularly or especially for those who have accepted his salvation. I'm going to tell you something. If you you will just give yourself to this process, give yourself to this process of becoming spiritually fit, God will help you, especially you, the ones who believe. He, He came and died He died for all, and particularly or especially for those who have accepted his salvation. You have help that you really cannot even imagine. You have so much help in getting spiritually fit. Um, 
I was supposed to tell a story here, and I can't remember what story that was. But I'll tell you this. Um, I, I, started, I started running uh, a few weeks ago, and, and you know, it's, sometimes it's cold. And I run at night because I don't want anybody to see my pathetic running, okay? <laughs> I don't want anybody to see how, how slow I run. But I, I, I can run a mile, and, and I, I try to run every night, and then I come home, and I'm telling you, it hurts. I talked about that earlier. It, it's painful. My lungs hurt. My lungs hurt. My, my rib cage under my rib cage hurts. My legs hurt still after like three weeks. It still hurts. And, uh, and when I get home, uh, it feels so good that I did it. It feels so good that I did it. And the next day, I'm still feeling good that I did it. And it makes me feel better, not only about myself, but it makes me feel physically better. Right? Um, why am I saying right so much today? That's an amateur thing to do, right? It's an amateur thing. I can't believe I'm saying it. But, but it's the same way spiritually. If you will give yourself to the process, if you will say, God, I'm ready to become spiritually fit, he will help you. And now I know what I was going to say. Um, I went to a Bruce Wilkinson conference years ago, uh, many years ago, 25 years ago. And, and he, it was a, the conference was called Personal Holiness in Times of Temptation. Now, if you don't know who Bruce Wilkinson is, he's the guy who wrote the Prayer of Jabez book. He's written lots of books. He has a, a ministry called Walk Through the Bible. It's a very famous ministry. And several other uh, ministries that he's founded and it's just a very prolific ministry guy and 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 he is one of the best speakers that I've ever heard go on YouTube and just look for Bruce Wilkinson he is he is just one of the best absolutely the best that uh, God has given us in this generation um, but he was talking about this process of becoming righteous, of becoming spiritually strong, of becoming holiness. That's what the conference was about, was about holiness. And he said, it takes about six months. He said, but if you will begin this and write this down, put it in your phone, just capture this, okay? He said, if you'll, if you'll just begin to confess all of your sins to the Holy Spirit, if you have a thought you can't do this with another person because you will wear them out, okay? Another person can't take it. Only the Holy Spirit can take it. But if you have a thought that's sinful, confess it to the Holy Spirit. If you say something that's sinful, right away, don't wait. You confess it to God. If things are not going your way and you're not responding the way that you should and you're not responding in faith but you're responding in fear or some other thing, confess it to the Holy Spirit and just continue to confess your, your sin nature, everything that's coming out of your sin nature. Begin to give all of that to the Holy Spirit just silently. You don't have to make a big deal about it. Just, just do it. Just confess those things to the Holy Spirit. And he says, it'll take a few months for most people, but you will be able to clean out, clear out all of that stuff that hinders your spirit, that stops your spirit from getting stronger. And I haven't done this in a long time, and I'm telling you, it works. When I was just putting this together this week, I, I remembered that. And uh, I've made that my, my next thing that I'm doing. So not only am I going to run a mile and get hurt every night, but I'm going to confess 
all of my stuff, all of my junk to uh, the Holy Spirit. And, and so do that. Try that. Try that. And what you'll find is that you feel so much better about yourself. You have this open line to God. And I've talked about this before, and I called it the open loop. Some of y'all, this was before COVID, so probably none of y'all were here. <laughs> Some of y'all were here. Uh, but, yeah, I talked about this open loop and having God in this, this open loop, having, having the loop of your thought process, having the loop of what all is going on inside here, having that open to God. And what you'll find is you feel better about yourself. You'll feel better about what God has called you to do. You'll feel closer to God, and you'll feel his presence with you all the time. Because, see, he's willing. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. It's not him. It's not him that's the problem. It's us. If we'll open the door to him, he says, I will come in. And I will eat with you. I will fellowship with you. I will be there with you. If you will just open the door. He said, I'm standing outside and I'm knocking. This is Jesus. Jesus says this. So open yourself to him. Try this. Try confessing everything to Jesus. Next thing I would say is follow the program. There is a program. It's not a complicated program. It's a very simple program program. Let's go and see what Hebrews says about Jesus himself. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, I need to just stop right here and let you know that in chapter 11, it talks about these great saints, these, this great cloud of witnesses, these people who have suffered. I mean, I don't want to say it all here, but they suffered torturous deaths. It talks about them in chapter 11. And it says, these people, these people, all having received a good report through faith, through their own faith, these are Old Testament people, did not receive the promise. What's the promise? The promise of the Spirit. They did not receive the promise. But God has provided some better thing for us. This is the end of 11. And that they without us cannot be made perfect or made complete. We have a role to play. This is the church of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about Old Covenant, Old Testament. We're talking about New Covenant, New Testament. This is our mission. This is our mission. Okay, you ready for the mission? Let us throw off everything that hinders. And let me just say about this great cloud of witnesses. This is like a stadium. It, it, this is the picture of of athletes running in a stadium and we are surrounded by this stadium full of saints who have gone before they are pulling for us because they want us to achieve our mission so that they can have what we have i know that's a lot i know that's very uh you know getting into theological stuff and i'll hear about it in our in our meeting go ahead and write that down julie um <laughs> But therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance. What are we supposed to run with? Come on. Perseverance. We're supposed to run with perseverance. That means we don't quit. You know that song we sung this morning? Unstoppable God. Mm. That's what he's talking about. Let the Spirit, let the Spirit work in you because the Spirit has perseverance. So let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. He is the leader. He's the one, he is our trainer. He's the one that we look to. He's the one who has, has, has uh, created the training program. He is the one who went before us. Let's look to him. He is the pioneer and the perfecter, or the author and the finisher of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is the author 
and the finisher, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. And it was joy. What was the joy? The joy was us. That was the joy. The joy was knowing, hey, my people are going to come after me. My people are going to follow me. My people are going to be like me. My people are going to look to me, and they are going to be spiritually fit. They're going to be strong. They're going to carry out my mission. And that was the joy that was set before him. And he endured the cross because of it. It scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And he said, it is finished. What was finished? Not everything was finished. But what was finished? What was finished was our salvation was secured. The, the giving of the Holy Spirit, that was secured for us. And the, the success and victory of our mission secured for us. He sat down. He got finished and he sat down at the throne of God. Consider him, Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. If you think it's tough for you, think about how tough it was for him. He endured such opposition from the very people that were his own people. John verse, uh, chapter 1 says he came to his own people. His own people did not receive him. So that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Think about Jesus, what he did. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. He's not asking you to shed your blood for your own sins. He's already shed his for your sins. This is, this is so much easier for us than it was for him. Your struggle against sin, in your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as father addresses, as a father addresses his son? And we're talking about son, gen, we're talking about position, not gender. It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Don't lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the ones that he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. So Jesus was the first son. Scripture says he was the firstborn of many brothers and sisters. Uh, we are adopted as sons, huius, the same word used for Jesus as the son, same word that he used for himself. And, and so God accepts us as sons with the Father's name, with the Father's authority, with the, the Father's bloodline, the inheritance of the Father. So good, so good. So the next thing, trade pain for fulfillment. Be willing to trade pain for fulfillment. It is exactly the same thing we do when we go to the gym. It is exactly the same thing we do when we put our running shoes on and we go for a run. We are trading some pain for fulfillment. It's what we do when we go to college, isn't it? We go to the library and we face pain. We open up the books and we study. It's pain. You have children. It's painful. More painful for the mother than the father. But after they're born, there's pain involved. Right? What is, what is also involved, though? Fulfillment. Oh, my gosh. A little bit of pain and a lot of fulfillment. It's like that in everything in life. Why should we think that the rules for Christianity would be any different than everything else in life? You, you go to work. What is work? It is pain. There's pain involved, right? I remember when I was young, 21, 22 years old, I had a, a friend who was a little bit older than me, probably seven or eight years older than me, and uh, I had... Um, 
I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. I was almost finished with school and uh, with college, and uh, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. And I was thinking that my, my car died, and I needed a job, and I was in a kind of a predicament. Uh, and this, I was trying to figure out what job I wanted, and I was talking to this guy about it. And I said, well, he said, well, have you thought about doing this? And I thought, well, I don't re- that's not really my passion, you know to do that. And well, have you thought about doing this? And I said, well, you know, that's not really me. You know, I, I, have you thought about doing this? I don't know. I might, I don't have to pray about that. And he finally said, Rob, he said, I got news for you. There's a reason why work is called work. It's work. Okay. It's work. There's pain involved. Be willing in your spiritual walk, to trade pain for fulfillment. I went through the Old Testament and New Testament, and I picked out uh, a lot of the things that we get whenever we trade pain for fulfillment in the kingdom. Okay, These are the rewards that, that the Scripture says that we get whenever we trade pain for fulfillment. These are the rewards. Old Testament. You will not be forsaken. Well, that's also New Testament. You will be delivered, Old Testament and New Testament. You will be shielded from evil. Uh, This just reminds me of the SOS thing that we're doing. We're really close, y'all. Really close. $5,400. $5,400. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Amen. We will be shielded from evil. We will have prosperity. Now, I'm not a prosperity preacher. Prosperity preachers, they make that the whole gospel. But it is true that Christianity is not about prosperity. But this is one of the rewards that the Scripture says. He says says you will be prosperous. You will have honor. Isn't it good to have honor? I tell you, that's one of the things that you'll feel whenever you have this open loop with God, whenever you uh, get in this relationship with him where you're giving it all to him as things come up. You give it to him when, when fear comes up. You confess that fear to him. When you're worried about something, you, you do what the Scripture says, and you say, okay, I'm not going to worry about this. I'm going to, instead, I'm going to confess this to God, and I'm going to trust him with it, and I'm going to thank him for all the good things that I have, you will begin to feel honor. You'll begin to feel it. And honor feels good. To be honorable, it feels good. And it doesn't take long, by the way. If you're not feeling honor in your life, it doesn't take long to feel the honor that God gives you And that other people give you whenever you open yourself to God and you begin this process of becoming spiritually fit. You will gain knowledge. What you know now, you'll know more. You'll know things that you don't know right now. You'll gain knowledge. Safety. You will be protected. All your needs will be met. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Is that good? My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. I wonder what that is. According to his riches, I, don't need, I, I, don't, I can't even count that high. According to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. <clears throat> all your needs will be met. You will be rewarded in this life and the life to come. Jesus said anyone who leaves lands or houses or family or people for my Sake, he said, will be rewarded a hundredfold in this life and the life to come. Is that a program you'd like to sign on for? And then eternal life. We have no idea. We, this is something we just really don't even know much about. But man, just think about that. Ain't nothing going to kill you. Jesus said, he who lives and believes in me. How many of you are alive right now? And, and how many of you are alive and believe in Jesus? Yeah, how many? Okay. Jesus said, will never die. He who lives and believes in me will never die. 
that, that ought to get an amen. That ought, to get a, that ought to get an applause right there. So I want to, I want to share one more thing with you. This is the last thing, Megan. It's the last thing. Megan's doing cartwheels back there. Um, so this is the last thing I want to share with you. This is from the brother of Jesus, James. James was the oldest brother besides Jesus. So it was Jesus, and then it was James, and then it was his other uh, brothers. He even had a brother named Judas. Go figure. Um, so James grew up with God. When he had a problem, he went straight to God, his older brother Jesus, and he said, what do I do about this? He grew up watching the way God works when he's in a human body. I, I, I think this is so, I always talk about it because I think it's so profound that we get the, we get the perspective of someone who spent more time with Jesus than probably anyone else maybe other than Mary. And this is what James says. He says, consider it pure joy. Pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, do we do that? Mm -mm. I tell you what, though. If you, if you get on the program and you begin to train, I'm telling you, you begin to train your spirit, even when the trials come, there is something in you that knows, you know it. You know that God is going to come through. You know it. You go back to the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that you need, all these things will be added. And so when I have a need, when I get in a spot where I, 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 I have a need, I Focus not on the need, but I focus on the kingdom. And then, miraculously, God meets the need. It's true. So he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when, when the trials, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces, what does it produce? Perseverance. Perseverance. It produces a Never quit mentality, a never quit attitude, a never quit. Like, I don't care what happens, I'm never going to quit. I'm, there's nothing that the enemy can do to make me stop believing in Jesus. There's nothing he can do to get me off of my faith. And he says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Wow. How many of you would like to have this? This is, this is absolutely possible. This is absolutely possible. James is not talking about something he doesn't know about. He's talking about what he does know about. He's saying, let perseverance finish. That's something that we don't think is even possible in the Christian world. We're never finishing anything, are we? We never get finished with anything. We don't believe in becoming uh, becoming the person that God wants you to be and to be complete in that, do we? We believe it's all, you know, always another day, another sin, another forgiveness, another, you know, church service, another this, another. It's just all, it just goes on forever and forever and forever. But if you read the Gospels and you read Paul and you read all these New Testament guys, you'll see that they believed in achieving, achieving something. They believed in achieving a finished work. They believed that you could actually be mature and complete, not lacking anything. How would, how would, that, how would you like that life? How would you like to have that? Where you're not always grasping for something that you don't have, but that you are mature and complete, and now you're able to give out to other people who don't have. That's what I want us to be. I want us to be a church of people who persevere, who believe that the work 
in us can be finished, that we can be mature and that we can be complete, not lacking anything. So, wrap it up. Get serious about your training, follow the program, and trade pain for fulfillment. Amen. I have this dream one day of, of the applause being like, <laughs> it's coming, y'all. It's coming. Hey, let me tell you something. Ben, they are not clapping for me. They are not clapping for me. Uh, they are clapping for Jesus. That's what we all are clapping for. Um, listen. This is so good. Our church is, our church is growing. It, things are good. Uh, we, are, we have come back after COVID. Uh, that first Sunday, I thought, man, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to happen. Ten people showed up. But you guys have come back. Our, our congregation is getting back, almost back to where we were before COVID. And I'm so glad. I told Lene yesterday, I said, you know, uh, we're still small. We're five years into this thing. We had this big bump in the road called COVID, and we're five years into it, and I thought we'd be so much bigger and doing so many more great things than what we're doing right now. But I said, hey, at least we're moving in the right direction, and we're moving in that direction with you guys. You are the best. That's what Rob says. Rob says, you are the best. I love you all. Let's pray.